welcome uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Ana Baptista. I am the co-director for the Tishman Environment and Design Center here at the New School. Um, and uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Tishman Center, uh, we are a university-wide center focused on uh, collaborative action-based research um, that we co-produce with partners in the environmental justice and climate justice movements. Uh, and we, we seek to support uh, movement leaders in their advocacy. And this paper on mandatory emissions reductions is very much a, a product and a reflection of this collaborative uh, co-produced approach to research. Um, and so you'll see here a diversity of co-authors and partners that uh, help to bring this paper to fruition. Um, and I'm gonna uh, briefly uh, introduce our panelists and presenters today. Uh, but before I do, I just also want to say a, a, a wonderful thank you. Uh, this paper was a long time in the making here, um, and it was the product, uh, a labor of love for, for many folks at the center and beyond the center, our partners in the EJ uh, movement. Um, and so I just want to recognize everyone that contributed to the paper and all the hard work of many uh, graduate research assistants, uh, Dr. Yuki Ann Lam, who's our research director now, uh, all the co-authors on the paper, um, and many of our partners um, who helped make this paper possible. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, with some quick bios so you know who uh, you'll be hearing from today, um, starting with uh, Dr. Nikki Sheets, who is the, a good friend and uh, comrade here uh, with uh, a collaborator with us. He's the director for the Center, the Center for uh, the Urban Environment at the John S. Watson Institute uh, for Urban Policy and Research at Kane University. And the primary mission of the center is really uh, in support of the environmental justice community, both in New Jersey and at the national level. Uh, Nikki's a founding member of the New Jersey EJ Alliance, and he's a member of the Equitable and Just National Climate Platform, among others. Um, he also is a member of the White House Council on Environmental Justice. Um, so thank you, Dr. Sheets, for joining us. Um, we also have presenting today with us um, Adrian Parovich, uh, who's here at the center uh, as our managing director. And um, Adrian had a big hand in this paper as well. She and she also provides strategic leadership around the center's mission, operational functions, um, and strategies. And she collaborates closely with departments across the university and also our community partners. Um, and um, she works on getting us aligned with the Hamish and EJ principles. Um, um, and so Adrian and Nikki are going to present some of the key findings of the paper. And then after that, those presentations, we're going to be joined by uh, several of our partners uh, who helped produce this report. Uh, Ms. Ancha Zaman, who's uh, the Federal Policy Director for the Center for Earth, Energy, and Democracy, and also a good friend and colleague and, and a longtime comrade here of ours. Uh, Ancha works uh, on developing training and resource hubs for communities and community organizers to help them stay informed about energy systems and fighting for more equitable policy frameworks. Ancha's research work at SEED includes building community energy models at center decision-making um, and um, for the most energy burdened communities. Uh, we also have with us Melissa Miles, who's the executive director for the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance. Um, and among the regional, national, international distinctions, Melissa is a member of the New, uh, New Jersey Environmental Justice Advisory Council. And um, she also serves as the vice chair of that council for the New Jersey DEP. Um, and Melissa's vision is to support environment and climate justice for communities rooted in place where people can live, work, learn, and play in health and harmony. And then we have our friends, uh, Michelle Roberts and Stephanie Heron. Uh, Michelle is the national co-coordinator of the Environmental Justice Health Alliance for Chemical Policy Reform. Um, she's also been a wonderful collaborator with us on, on many projects. Um, and for over 25 years, uh, Michelle has provided capacity support, organizing and technical assistance um, uh, to communities on chemicals management, oil and gas extraction, energy systems, and toxics exposure and legacy. And Michelle also currently serves on the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council uh, for the Biden administration. 
And last but not least, we have Stephanie Heron, who's a national organizer with EJHA, um, has 10 years or more experience working on climate change, EJ, environmental health, and comical policy. Stephanie supports capacity and power building on the ground with EJ communities and helps lead federal policy advocacy uh, on a just transition towards safer chemicals and pollution-free economy. So I want to thank all of our esteemed panelists uh, and partners uh, who made this effort possible. Um, and we will have uh, the report that's been released officially today on our website, and we'll put a link to that report at the end of the presentation today so you all can download it and access it. And we look forward to hearing from you on uh, what your thoughts are on the paper. Um, and I am now uh, going to turn it over to um, Dr. Sheets to get us started on the presentation of the paper results. You want to take uh, it away? Thank uh, thanks, Anna. I'm going to try to share the screen and see if I can get my PowerPoint. Does everybody see my PowerPoint? Yeah. Yeah. See. So, okay. See if I can get it in. Uh... There we go. Get in presentation mode. So thanks very much, Anna, for the introduction. Thanks to the um, Tishman Center for organizing this panel. And I've been tasked with starting off the panel and explaining uh, the main idea that we want to present to you today, which we, which is kind of be called mandatory emissions reductions. And it's a rather unique environmental justice, uh, climate change mitigation policy developed from an EJ perspective. So let me start off by uh, providing you the motivation for developing that uh, policy. Um, and these are two figures that I've shown um, to audiences all audiences all over the country. They show the relationship between cumulative impacts, race, and income in New Jersey. Um, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection produced these figures in 2009. For the purposes of these figures, you can think of cumulative impacts as a very rough estimate of the total amount of pollution in New Jersey neighborhoods. And the first thing that uh, New Jersey DEP did uh, was to assign a cumulative, imp cumulative impact score to every neighborhood in New Jersey, and then to figure out the relationship between race income and um, the estimate of total amount of pollution in New Jersey neighborhoods. They graphed the cumulative impact scores against race and income and um, came up with these unfortunate, what I'll call unfortunate figures, because look at the top figure. You'll see that as the number of people of color living in a New Jersey neighborhood increases, so does the estimate of the total amount of pollution in that neighborhood. And you'll see the same relationship for people living in poverty. As the number of people living in poverty in, increases, uh, you'll, you'll see, uh, again, there's an increase in the estimate of total amount of pollution in that neighborhood. So I'll say what I've said to audiences all over the country. I'll say it again. What these figures is providing you evidence of is that if you live in New Jersey, the amount of pollution in your neighborhood is connected to race and income, i.e. the color of your skin, the amount of money in your pocket. And of course, this goes against everything that the country and the state at least claim um, that they stand for. Now, let me say a couple more things about, about these figures. Um, these relationships uh, are not unique to New Jersey. If other states uh, did similar investigations, many of them we think would have similar findings. And in fact, one of the things that started the national grassroots EJ movement are several national reports that did have similar, similar findings. And the second thing is that why we are concerned about the disproportionate pollution load that you see depicted here in environmental justice neighborhoods and the way we're defining environmental justice neighborhood is uh, uh, neighborhoods of color and neighborhoods of any color that are uh, of low income. Uh, and, you, and you see these figures depicting the disproportionate pollution loads in these neighborhoods and or estimates anyway. And why we're worried about that is that these disproportionate pollution loads or elevated levels of cumulative impacts um, contribute to um, persistent and recalcitrant health disparities that exist in our country that are uh, rooted in race and income. So when we see these figures as EJ people, and they don't surprise us, 
we immediately think, well, we have to develop policies and, and laws and regulations to address these disproportionate pollution loads. Okay, and that's what we're gonna talk about now because one policy we developed, oh, uh, so let me say, I cite these three studies because I recognize that the, um, that the data that the figures I just showed you are, 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 are based on is a little bit dated. It comes from late 1990s, early 2000s, but there have been more recent studies that have similar findings showing that EJ communities uh, are disproportionately exposed to air pollution. So uh, uh, the policy we want to tell you about today uh, is climate change mitigation policy from an EJ perspective. And basically we're saying that we not only want to use climate change mitigation policy to fight climate change, but also to uh, fight the disproportionate pollution loads that you saw depicted in EJ neighborhoods. So we also want to use it to fight local, local air pollution. And here's a basic premise um, uh, of what we basically want to see. One thing we want to see from climate change mitigation policy from an EJ perspective. Now, probably all of you know, uh, remember the climate change mitigation policy typically fights climate change by reducing emissions of carbon dioxide. Well, from an EJ perspective, we also want, and we want to do that, but from an EJ perspective, we also want to see emissions reductions in EJ communities. And that's the basic premise. Here's a more detailed premise of what we want from climate change mitigation policy. Now, if you understand this, here, this is basically the presentation. So if you get this, you can walk away from the computer until the next um, presenter, but please don't do that. Uh, hang in there with us. So um, let me walk you through this detailed premise. You'll see at first we say, we want guaranteed emissions reductions in the near EJ communities. Uh, well, why are we even saying that? Because I just said the climate change mitigation is all about reducing emissions of carbon dioxide. Yes, but you don't get emissions reductions, depending on what type of climate change mitigation policy is being used, you don't get reductions um, in emissions from power plants, from all power plants located um, in all places. And we want emissions reductions from power plants that are in EJ communities or from power plants that um, significantly impact EJ communities. And remember our definition of EJ community are communities of color and low income communities. Okay, so that's what we want. Now, how are we going to achieve these reductions? Well, we have um, a number, we have four alternative ways to achieve these reductions. And I'm gonna walk you through them and hopefully don't confuse you in the process. The best way to achieve these uh, reductions, and maybe the simplest way, the most straightforward way, is to just close those plants that are located in EJ communities, or close those plants that significantly and detrimentally impact EJ communities. But we understand for a variety of reasons that include politics and other reasons, um, we might not be able to close these all the plants located in EJ communities. So the next best alternative is to intentionally maximize reductions of greenhouse co-pollutants from these plants while we are achieving a carbon dioxide reduction goal. So let's pull that apart um, and explain what that means. You you almost certainly know uh, uh, what a greenhouse gas is. And typically it's carbon dioxide. And these are the gases that are causing, um, that are causing climate change. And again, uh, most climate change, all climate change mitigation policy wants to reduce emissions of carbon dioxide, and so do we. But we also want to reduce emissions of greenhouse gas or carbon dioxide co-pollutants. Well, what's that? Power plants emit not only carbon dioxide, but they also emit other air pollutants along with the carbon dioxide. And in vernacular climate change mitigation policy, uh, these other air pollutants are called greenhouse gas co-pollutants. And they consist of such air pollutants as fine particulate matter, fine refers to the size of the particle, nitrogen oxides, um, sulfur dioxides, and hazardous, hazardous uh, air pollutants. And let's talk about the difference in a minute between the carbon dioxide and these co-pollutants. You'll, you'll hear carbon dioxide sometimes referred to as a global pollutant. And that's because the current thinking is that when you're fighting climate change, when you're fighting climate change, it doesn't matter where you reduce the carbon dioxide. Reducing it in New York is the same as reducing it 
in California. And the carbon dioxide, when you're outside at least, doesn't harm you directly. The way it harms you is by causing climate change. The greenhouse gas coal pollutants are different. They do harm you directly. They do cause detrimental local impacts. And in fact, they are part of that um, disproportionate pollution load that you saw depicted in the figures that I showed you a few minutes ago. So from an easier perspective, not only do we want climate change mitigation policy to reduce the carbon dioxide and fight climate change, we also wanted to reduce these greenhouse gas coal pollutants and make communities healthier by reducing the disproportionate pollution loads we often find in EJ communities. If you can't just close the plants down, then the next best thing is to maximize this choose strategies to maximize to maximize reductions of these greenhouse gas coal pollutants while you're reducing um, the carbon dioxide and you mandate the reduction of these coal pollutants. If you can't do that, if you can't uh, develop a policy that maximizes the coal pollutant reduction, then um, uh, we're advocating that you just require the reduction of the coal pollutants at some level that may be below what, what you could do if you chose strategies to actually maximize that. Um, if you chose strategies to actually maximize the reduction of these coal pollutants. Now, I should add that there's no climate change policy uh, currently, no climate change mitigation policy that's currently being used that we know of that actually requires reduction of coal pollutants much longer maximizes their reduction. The last alternative I want to present to you, the last alternative policy to reduce the greenhouse gas coal pollutants is to simply mandate reduction of the carbon dioxide um, emissions from power plants in EJ communities and for plants that significantly impact EJ communities. By doing this, you are going to achieve some coal pollutant reduction, not as much as if you close plants or maximize coal pollutant um, reduction, but you will achieve some reductions. Um, this would be an effective policy in helping to reduce disproportionate pollution loads in EJ community. Now there's a caveat here though. This assumes that you're not using uh, carbon capture and sequestration, CCS, or hydrogen coal fire. And I'll talk about why it assumes that in a minute. Um, this slide is just talking a little bit more about the greenhouse gas coal pollutants. The coal pollutant that we are typically most worried about is fine particulate matter because it causes a lot of death and destruction. And um, particularly in EJ communities, because as I mentioned before, uh, there is um, elevated exposure to air polluted, local air pollution in environmental justice communities. Now, the climate change mitigation policy that we're advocating here, or that we developed here, uh, presents us, uh, I have on the slide, goal and opportunity. It presents us with an opportunity to achieve a goal we haven't been able to achieve thus far uh, without using climate change mitigation policy to address local air pollution. Look, uh, there are policies already that are being used to address these coal pollutants, but we want to use climate change mitigation policy on top of these policies in conjunction with these policies to drive down concentrations and emissions of these um, coal pollutants to levels we've not been able to achieve thus far. We want to drive them down as low as possible. And one reason is because the science is telling us that uh, in particular, for a particulate matter air pollution, there's no lower concentration of uh, particulate matter in, in the air, below which if you don't keep lowering it, you won't get health benefits. I'll say that in English. The lower the concentration of fine particulate matter in the air, the better. So we want to, again, use climate change mitigation policy in conjunction with current policies to drive down uh, emissions and concentrations of these greenhouse gas coal pollutants and to reduce disproportionate pollution loads in EJ communities. And this idea seems fairly straightforward. We recognize it may not, may not be as straightforward to implement. So the question you may, may be asking is, well, what's the problem? Well, from an EJ perspective, the problem is the kind of policies we are, climate change mitigation policies we're currently using 
and that are currently being proposed. Let's start with market-based policies, uh, in particular, carbon trading, because there are carbon trading policies currently being used. Uh, I, I won't go into the details of how carbon trading policy works, but uh, let me just say that it's a market mechanism and uh, from an EJ perspective, and you can ask more questions about this during the, during the Q&A, from an EJ perspective, one of the main problems with it is that it doesn't uh, mandate emissions reductions uh, from all power plants at all locations. So it's not mandating reductions um, from power plants located in EJ communities. So I, ironically, and, and that's kind of a nice way of, of putting it, uh, when you use carbon trading, there's no guarantee that you'll get emissions reductions from the power plants located in the communities with the most pollution. But let me be careful. I'm not saying that under carbon trading or other market mechanisms, the other main one is a carbon tax. I'm not saying that you will not get any emissions reductions in EJ communities from, from these um, uh, climate change mitigation policies. Three things can happen to emissions in EJ communities under carbon trading. They can increase, they can stay the same, they can be reduced. Uh, on, from an EJ perspective, two of these are not good because we want to decrease emissions um, in EJ communities. So carbon trading will always leave you with EJ questions. They, they will leave you um, wondering how many EJ communities will receive reductions on the carbon trading, which communities will receive reductions, what will be the extent of those reductions, and over what time period will they occur? From an EJ perspective, these are just too many questions, and that's why we're not supportive of carbon trading. So what's the other, what are the other climate change mitigation methodologies um, that we are worried about? Well, uh, hydrogen co-firing, sometimes called hydrogen mixing, and carbon capture and sequestration, from an EJ perspective, are also problematic. And both of these metric methodologies are being proposed by EPA in a recent rule that was released in May. So under carbon capture and sequestration, you capture, uh, the idea is anyway, you capture the carbon dioxide from the power plant before it goes into the atmosphere, and then you pipe it somewhere else and you store it underground. Uh, for hydrogen co-firing, you use hydrogen as a fuel instead of oil or coal um, or natural gas, and it produces less carbon dioxide. Well, what's the problem? From an EJ perspective, one of the problems is that both of these me methodologies uh, um, will not only uh, not decrease coal polluted emissions, but have the potential to increase them. And remember, we want to decrease coal polluted em emissions. And now we'll talk about methodologies that have the potential to increase them. Also, because you're piping carbon dioxide away from the plants and maybe piping hydrogen to the plants, uh, you also have the potential of pipeline leaks. And with carbon capture and sequestration, you have the potential of leaks from your underground storage areas. So these are problems from an EJ perspective. Also, remember before I mentioned with the detailed premise of what we want from climate change mitigation policy, the last alternative I presented talked about reducing coal polluted emissions by reducing carbon dioxide emissions. Well, that's assuming there's a correlation between carbon dioxide emissions and greenhouse gas coal polluted emissions. If you use CCS and hydrogen coal firing, um, that decouples that relationship between carbon dioxide emissions and greenhouse gas coal polluted emissions. Because remember, with both of these, theoretically, you're decreasing carbon dioxide emissions, but you're not decreasing, you're not decreasing greenhouse gas coal pollutant emissions. So this last alternative won't work with CCS or hydrogen coal firing, which is another reason why we don't, we, why we are not advocating CCS and hydrogen coal firing. Okay, let me close by saying this. I've given you uh, some details of a specific climate change mitigation policy. Take a step backwards. And what we're saying is that EJ and equity should be part of any climate change mitigation policy. It should be incorporated into any climate change mitigation policy. And what happens a lot now is that the carbon dioxide 
uh, uh, reduction part of the climate change mitigation policy goes forward. And the easy and equity policy is left to be figured out later. That shouldn't happen, right? The equity and EJ part of the climate change mitigation policy should happen right along up front with the carbon dioxide reduction part. And uh, in the case of what we're talking about, right, emissions reductions is how we're kind of defining easy and equity here. Those emissions reductions, where they occur, should be planned and intentional, decided by policymakers and communities and not by the market. So I'll close by issuing a challenge to folks uh, listening. Uh, often we hear uh, from uh, individuals and organizations that EJ and equity are important to them. If that is true, then the challenge is to make obtaining emissions reductions of greenhouse gas reductions for EJ communities as important as obtaining emissions reductions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And if you do that, the um, the uh, the uh, young girl the picture in the picture who's from the EJ community will be healthier and happier. And I am gonna stop there and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and pass it back to Professor Bautista, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki, for um, going into uh, detail here, explaining um, the ins and outs of what is mandatory emissions reductions. And I, I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague at the Tishman Center, Adrian Parovich, who's going to share a little bit more about the findings um, from the report. Adrian, you want to take it away? Yep. Hi, everybody. Um, so this first slide here reiterates what Dr. Sheets was saying about the policy options that we laid out in the report. So just to reiterate once again, the best option is to close power plants in EJ communities and transition to renewable energy. The next best option is to mandate reductions in both CO2 and co-pollutant emissions simultaneously. Um, and again, do this without carbon capture sequestration or hydrogen mixing or other dangerous technologies. And then the third option would be to mandate a reduction in CO2 emissions with the assumption that you will then get the co-pollutant emission reductions at the same time. Um, so can we go to the next slide, please? So this is our framework for how we suggest going about implementing an MER policy in your area. So the first step would be to identify power plants located in EJ communities. The second step would then allow you to look at some of the options proposed here and pick which option fits your area or your location the best or your political environment. And then the final option would be if you thought it was appropriate to prioritize certain plans for an earlier or faster um, emissions reduction. So we suggested various ways that you could do that. One is to prioritize plants with the highest level of co-pollutant emissions. The second way would be to focus on plants located in cum um, in communities with high amounts of cumulative burdens, as, as Dr. Sheets discussed earlier. And there are a variety of indicators you can use to find those communities, including tools such as EPA's EJ screen. And then another potential option would be to look at population density. So which plants are in communities with high population density? Um, and then we go to the next slide. So this is a little bit about the methodology that we used in terms of how we identified the power plants, how we identified the EJ communities, and um, how we worked with our community EJ partners to build a collaborative project. So we did use power plants that are 25 megawatts or greater for all three states. And the reason we chose this amount is because the regional greenhouse gas, gas initiative in the Northeast uses this. So both New Jersey and Delaware are members of REGI, and they follow the 25 megawatt capacity threshold. And then for Minnesota, it's not a REGI state, but we still use the same 25 megawatt capacity threshold for power plants in Minnesota. Um, and then to identify EJ communities, we know that there are different ways to do this. For the purposes of this study, we chose three indicators. 
race, percent low income households, and percent households with limited English proficiency. And we decided to use race and income based based criteria because it is consistent with the scientific literature, showing that those factors are key predictors of environmental inequality, as well as policy guidance from things like New Jersey's new EJ law. And we, within that, we looked at census tracts within a three mile radius of each power plant. Again, this three mile radius is consistent with the scientific literature. Um, and with the EPA's power plant mapping tool. And then the last piece I wanted to highlight was that this was a collaborative process. So the scope and analysis were developed with input from EJ stakeholders in each of the three case study states. And we gathered feedback from our stakeholders at iterative processes throughout the study. So for example, one way we did this was we would collect a list of power plans from a state or national database and then work with our EJ partners to ensure that we were ground truthing the power plans that were identified to be in EJ communities. Um, and this is one way to ensure accuracy and that we were protecting as many communities as possible. So to highlight some of our findings, and I do hope you all refer back to the report after the webinar, but um, one of the findings was that yes, there was this transition from coal to natural gas, but we still see that power plants continue to pollute in EJ communities and that the highest emitters of toxic air pollution in all three states disproportionately impact people of color and low income communities. So again, we know race is a factor associated with proximity to a power plant, and it should be considered when developing climate mitigation strategies. And then on the next slide, I want to talk about our call to action. Um, we really use this paper to build on the policy idea set forth by Dr. Nikki Sheets in his original 2017 paper to show why and how the power se sector should implement mandatory admissions reductions. As Nikki explained earlier, what's being offered as the centerpiece for the US power sector looks nothing like mandatory admissions reductions policy and does not protect EJ communities, communities of color, and those on the front lines of this crisis. These policies include things like carbon capture and utilization or sequestration or hydrogen mixing, and the landscape is worrisome. We see the MER policy as the antidote to carbon capture, and this is the real solution. So I'm going to pass it back to Anna. Thank you. Thank you so much to Adrian for giving us a really succinct <laughs> summary of a, of a very detailed report, and I encourage you all to, to please take a look at the, the full findings in the report. It's a very rich document. Um, and thank you, Dr. Sheets, as usual, for um, bringing forth and explaining um, the, the whole concept of MER. Um, and as they both mentioned, the paper both lays out the MER policy um, as well as uh, three case studies. And those three case studies focused on New Jersey, uh, Delaware, and Minnesota. And we looked at the power plants in those three states with the help of our panelists, who I'm gonna turn to now to have a little bit of a conversation with them about um, their insights uh, on the findings in the MER paper. Um, so I'm gonna turn first um, to, uh, Melissa Miles, the Executive Director of uh, New Jersey EJ Alliance, um, and ask her to share with us a little bit about uh, the context of how the power sector um, in New Jersey in particular, um, what that looks like, how it impacts EJ communities, and some of the work that New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance is planning around the uh, mandatory emissions reduction policy. So I don't know if Melissa, you're here, you wanna um, yes. share a little bit about. Okay, so um, Yukian, I don't know if you can pin the other, uh, because I'm on camera, but on the laptop. But in the meanwhile, I will start. Thanks, Anna. Um, 
And thank you so much, Dr. Sheets. Um, you know, I, I really feel like you said it all, you know, as you were speaking, um, you know, I remembered why I definitely consider you a, a mentor and you are a hero to so many of us um, because you've been doing this uh, work for so long and in this way that is uncompromising and uh, so protective of our EJ communities. Um, so just to introduce myself, I am Melissa Miles. I am the executive director of the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance or NJEJA. NJEJA has been around for a little over 20 years um, and we work to provide technical assistance and training to build power in communities. Um, and we also work hard to hold decision making makers accountable uh, from the local to the national level. Uh, so New Jersey, as most of you may know, is the densest US state. Uh, we have over 9 million bodies packed into what is the fifth smallest state. And we're also hosting a sizable chunk of the entire region's energy, waste, and good move, goods movement infrastructure. So the work that NJEJA does um, really attends to all of those uh, areas because all of those areas right now, uh, goods movement, energy, and waste are uh, producing tons of emissions that are impacting the health and well-being of the communities that host them, which are largely uh, EJ communities, which we define as communities of color and low-income communities. Uh, so NJEJA, along with the Tishman Center, the Watson Institute, and other um, New Jersey partners were instrumental in the passage and the rulemaking process of the New Jersey EJ law, which actually had its third birthday uh, just yesterday. Um, and that law really focuses on the cumulative burdens that New Jersey communities need to be protected from, uh, the cumulative impacts of uh, pollution in their communities. So NJEJA, our two principal frameworks, the ways that we operate come out of uh, the acknowledgement and necessity of a cumulative impacts framework, as well as the mandatory emissions reductions framework that um, Dr. Sheets laid out. Both of those we feel are um, the keys and the tools we need to adequately uh, protect communities with um, policy and, and through organizing. Um, NJEJA is also, of course, a contributor to the report that we're discussing today. Um, so because so much has been said um, in, you know, a, a manner that, you know, really just is, it was so clear uh, to me, um, but honestly, I did have, I've been hearing this for eight or nine years now. So to me, it's clear, but hopefully, you know, I'll help to um, really bring the community voice and perspective to what um, Adrian and Dr. Sheets have presented. Uh, so one is, you know, we we in EJ communities, we are bearing the burden of the fossil fuel um, infrastructure for energy in New Jersey, which means that we are also bearing the burden of those co-pollutants that are coming along with the um, greenhouse gases. Like Dr. Sheets says, the greenhouse gases are impacting the entire planet, but the co-pollutants are impacting the people who live closest to those facilities. Um, so because you know at NJEJA, we're really steeped in these frameworks of mandatory emissions reductions and cumulative impacts, we are not carbon centric. We do not um, necessarily believe that all uh, greenhouse gas reduction policies are going to get us to co-pollutant uh, reductions. As we see, it's not always the case. We don't want to trade greenhouse gases for co-pollutants. It's not enough for us to say, okay, everyone is going to see reductions in, in greenhouse gases, um, but your community is going to see an increase in NOx. That's not a fair deal for us. So at NJEJA, we are never going to support a policy that is going to potentially increase coal pollutants in the communities that are already uh, burdened by this infrastructure and these, um, these coal pollutants from the fossil uh, generation of energy. Um, we need for the larger environmental community to stand with us on this. Too often, EJ communities are the ones that are being sacrificed for climate policy. Um, these policies, while they may, again, benefit the greater good, 
They will hopefully, you know, slow down the warming of our planet. Um, we, you know, we are always the ones who have to carry the burden. So, you know, we're just saying enough. You know, if the policy does not protect our community, then we don't want it. We don't want to see it. We don't want to hear about it. Please don't ask us to support it uh, because as I, I can only speak for NJEJA. We will not. And as a matter of fact, um, you know, having the privilege to sit on so many in so many spaces where grassroots groups, EJ groups, climate justice groups from around the country are coming together, the general what I'm generally hearing is we will not. Um, I cannot speak for every community, um, but what I will say is do not make or support these policies without us. Because if you do, you will not be the hero. I don't believe that history will look back on these moments where we have the choice um, to either you know, move ahead with climate policies that will potentially harm people who the harm has already been done to, um, or to, to take a different stand, right? Um, that may not be as visible, that may not be as easy, you know, but again, I don't believe that history will look back on the folks who pushed the the uh, you know the the carbon markets, the CCS, the hydrogen as the heroes of this story. In fact, um, you know, unfortunately, we may be the pawns of the fossil industry because at the end of the day, many of these mechanisms just prolong the lifespan of the very industries that most of us want to see um, sunset, right? While we're still here, um, or at least in time for our, uh, you know, it, our um, future generations to enjoy the planet. So um, I do believe that, you know, the environmental movement as a whole has the same goals and desires in, 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 in sight, but, um, you know, we really once again need uh, for the environmental community to take the lead of those who are on the front lines of the infrastructure, who are saying we need better solutions, ones that um, don't sacrifice our, our community. So, um, you know, in summation, we do not want to um, exchange uh, greenhouse gases for other types of pollutants. And, and that is pretty much what we are looking at, um, you know, with these uh, CCS, hydrogen, uh, carbon market um, uh, schemes and policies that, you know, um, are still relying on, on markets to get us to, um, you know, climate goals when really the two are not connected in the, in the kind of positive way that they would need to be for that to be the case. And um, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for um, summarizing and telling us a little bit about what's happening in New Jersey and also your work on these issues. Um, so critical. And a little teaser, uh, the Tishman Center will also be coming out um, with uh, research on CCS and hydrogen in the power sector and the environmental justice implications of that uh, with some of the same partners that are here, including <laughs> Um, Ancha, who I'm going to turn to next, Ancha from the Center for Earth, Energy, and Democracy. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and Ancha is joining us from Minnesota, which has a very different context than New Jersey when it comes to power plants and um, how they're located uh, and the mix of power plants in that in their state. Um, and so I wanted to ask Ancha if she could share a little bit about um, what the power se sector looks like in, in Minnesota how it impacts EJ communities uh, where you are, and also what role you see MER playing in the state um, going forward. So Ancha, if you wanna take it away. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Baptista. And, and hello everyone. I, I feel like I'm there in spirit in New York, joining everyone for Climate Week. Um, so first of all, a, a big thank you to the Tishman Center for putting this report together. Um, and, and Dr. Sheets and Melissa for your presentation, Adrian for your presentation. Um, I was I was able to take a quick look at the at the report before uh, joining today, and it's it's the, the 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 three case studies are really remarkable and just like point to um, a, a great examples of what what the power sector challenges are for EJ communities across the country. 
Um, so uh, before before I talk about the Minnesota context, just a little bit about SEED. So Center for Earth, Energy, and Democracy, SEED, we're a community-based organization. Um, we're based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and uh, while we do a lot of national work, um, we also do a lot of hyper-local work in the Twin Cities metro area, especially around energy efficiency. Um, and before I give the Minnesota context, I'd like to just preface that by saying that there are a number of thriving um, advocacy groups and uh, EJ groups and community-based organizations in, in, in Minnesota that have been working very closely with the state PUC and the state legislature, and of course, their own constituents to, to make meaningful progress on climate and on EJ. And um, I'm sure you all have seen all of the recent movement with the state legislature in the news. And so that that movement is, is for sure owed to a lot of the advocacy of the, of the groups on the ground here in the state. Um, and if you speak to each group, though, the, while we all share similar analysis, um, uh, the, each group also has their own perspective, depending on what constituents they're serving and what their area of focus is. So I can, when I give the Minnesota context, I, I can only speak to the analysis that SEED has in, as an organization and based on based on the kind of work we do. Um, so with that with that preface, um, for for Minnesota. That's right, Minnesota the power sector does look very different from the power sector in New Jersey and Delaware. Um, currently, I think someone is on. Yeah, um, their phone, if you could um, please yeah. mute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much for muting. Um, so as I was saying, um, Minnesota power sector does look a bit different than uh, the power sector in New Jersey and Delaware. Um, currently for our state, most of the electricity that we consume um, is generated through renewable resources, so about 30%, and that's a pretty recent change. Um, the next share of, of um, our electricity comes from coal um, and then nuclear and natural gas. And a lot of the renewable resources um, are actually is actually wind. Uh, the state also accounts for biomass as a as a renewable resource. Um, so, like I said, the shift to a larger share of renewable energy in the power sector has is is pretty recent because even up until like two years ago, coal had the largest share um, in the power sector. And so that 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 this shift has happened over the last decade. Um, and slowly wind over the last decade, slowly wind has taken up a, a, a bigger chunk of electricity generation. And then natural gas over the last decade has taken up a larger chunk of uh, the electricity generation. Utilities have built more natural gas plants and something else that they've done is they've converted coal plants into natural gas plants. And so previously, um, some of these coal plants were lo were located in are located were located in EJ communities, and now those some, same coal plants are uh, are natural gas plants located in EJ communities. Um, so the two the two natural gas plants that I would I would highlight are ones in the Twin Cities metro area, um, and they're located in regions identified as as an EJ community. Um, there's the Riverside Natural Gas Plant, which is located in northeast. Minneapolis. Um, it's very close to where I live. Um, it's in the Marshall Terrace neighborhood, and at least 40% or more of the population there is, is people of color. Um, the place is right next to the Mississippi River. It, as you can imagine, it's also co-located co with other industrial facilities. So there's a shingles and roofing manufacturing facilities nearby. There used to be a metal shredding facility that the community fought against and shut down. Um, and it's also very, very close to residential homes, single family homes. And as the report points out, that, that plant is also one of the top emitters of PM2.5 in the, in the state. Um, and it's a similar story with the other natural gas plant in the metro area, which is the High Bridge plant in St. Paul. Um, and it's also located in a predominantly uh, POC neighborhood, uh, a Latinx neighborhood. And so the state, while the state is making progress on shutting down existing coal plants, we don't know what the future of the existing natural gas plants look like in, in, in Egypt communities. 
And then the last thing about the power sector that I'll highlight is a, a large chunk of our um, electricity is also generated from nuclear. Um, and so uh, while the state has a ban on uh, building any new nuclear power plants, the, there are two existing nuclear power plants that continue to operate. One of them is in, in, in is located in, in an indigenous community, and the other one, Monticello Nuclear Power Plant, uh, just received an extension from the state to continue operations for 10, 10 more years. Um, and it'll have to go through some fed, federal regulatory processes, but it looks like it'll, it'll that that plant will continue to exist. Um, and in the news, you, you you might have seen there was a, a New uh, a report of a leak um, earlier this year from from that from that facility. Um, so that's a little bit about the Minnesota power sector. Um, in terms of how MER could play out in the state, I think there are some ways pathways through which advocates could could um, ask for uh, uh, could could push for an, an MER policy. Um, earlier in the year, Minnesota signed into law the 100% clean energy. Bill, um, and that sets a goal for the state to reach 100% carbon free, quote unquote, carbon free electricity by 2040. And so, what that means is utilities have to meet a more updated renewable energy standard. So, they have to ensure that at least 55% of um, their electricity sales come from renewable sources by 2035. Uh, and that, that includes biomass and hydro. Um, and then by 2040, all electricity sold, sold, sold in the state must be generated from quote unquote carbon free resources. So that includes nuclear, hydro, biomass. But that also means that by 2040, all fossil fuel fired power plants, or coal and natural gas plants should be phased out by 2040. And this isn't, this isn't, a, it's a technology specific uh, uh, mechanism, so it's not technology agnostic. So that it it does mean if if you know if the law gets implemented the way it's written, we should we shouldn't have fossil fuel fuel powered power, fired power plants after 2050, 2040. Um, and but utilities, of course, are given a lot of leeway in how they can meet the standard. They can delay on the timeline, um, uh, but advocates can hold the utilities responsible to an to to an aggressive aggressive timeline. And the way I mean, could play out is as advocates, we can ask for planned and intentional and early retirements of coal and natural gas facilities first and foremost in Egypt communities. The law, law also defines an Egypt community. Um, and it's it's fairly, it's fairly, it's fairly expansive. It uses race and income and linguistic isolation as factors in, in defining an Egypt community. Um, we we also passed uh, a cumulative impacts law, which is not not as expensive as the law in New Jersey, um, but that does give the pollution control agency mechanisms to um, uh, mechanisms to do cumulative impact assessments, but while making permitting decisions. So, combined with that with that law, I, I can see opportunities for. Um, aggressive retirements of fossil fuel, fuel power, fired power plants in Asia communities in Minnesota. Um, yeah. That's great. That's that's good. A little bit of good news. Then it seems like there's some hope on the horizon in Minnesota for potentially seeing the end of uh, and the tr transition away from these fossil fuels in particular, the ones that are impacting EJ communities the, the worst and first. So Thank you so much, Ancha, for giving us a little um, insight into what's happening in, in Minnesota. Um, and, and I'll just say a word about SEED is, you know, when we started looking at MER with Dr. Sheets and Dr. Cecilia Martinez, who was at SEED at the time um, after the Clean Power Plan was um, being proposed at that time uh, by the by the EPA, um, this idea started to emerge by, with more um, I think fervor, uh, hoping that we could attack uh, the problem, not just of climate mitigation, but all these emissions. So a big thank you to Seed for being a leader in this area for a long time. All right, now I'm gonna turn to our friends um, in Delaware, Michelle and Steph, uh, to share a little bit about um, 
what's happening in Delaware, our neighbors in Delaware. It's it's interesting when we looked at Delaware and New Jersey, we had a lot of similarities, uh, I think, in terms of where these power plants showed up and what kinds of power plants we were seeing. Uh, but I know you all have a, a long history of working in the state on not just on the power sector, but also um, helping Egypt communities that are facing pollution from the chemical um, and industrial sectors as well. And I thought maybe you could share a little bit about how you see um, mandatory emissions reduction potentially helping uh, not only with the power plants um, that are in the state reducing their their pollution, but also how it you 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 might want to see it applied to other industries, um, in particular the chemical industry that I know you all work uh, very very diligently on. Thank you. We're so excited to be part of this Climate Week, and in more so, really excited to be part of this esteemed panel. Um, grateful for the scholarship, Dr. Baptista of you and and Dr. Nikki Sheets and Dr. Yukian Lam uh, and and Dr. Uh, Adrian. Um, you know, as as you said. Uh, this conversation stems back for us for a very long time. Delaware uh, has what we call Delaware Concerned Residents for Environmental Justice is an affiliate member of the Environmental Justice Health Alliance for chemical policy reform. We're gonna use our whole name today, Environmental Justice Health Alliance for chemical policy reform that was named by our affiliates, some of whom we see on the screen and um, who are actually um, participating as, as um, viewers of this panel today. We'd like to give a shout out to them. They We are uh, grassroots community-based organizations um, across this nation harmed by legacy pollution, which is exceptionally important for us to understand. Um, and in addition to that, we, uh, we EJHA, work exceptionally hard in strategic partnership and alignment with another with a network, the Coming Clean Network. Um, you will hear a little bit about that from Stephanie, but what I wanna really get clear today is that the interesting part of Delaware, uh, we often hear from our, uh, our officials in Delaware that, oh, our pollution is coming in from other states, right? Um, but what is important to know and what we found from this work with you all is that um, the majority of our power, the power that's coming in for communities is indeed coming in from other states that is equally um, combined with that of the existing lo uh, local power plants, right? And so with that being said, speaking of the cumulative impacts, uh, as Dr. Sheets spoke to, we're getting that double whammy effect. So here it is that it's our power plants, it's it's our neighbors, the, the emissions coming in from our neighbors' power plants. In addition to that, um, the unfortunate thing is the emissions and the uh, pollution from that of the legacy chemicals, right? And then as we're... Um, now, as we see and as we have been witnessing over these past couple of years, especially, we see an even more extreme number of chemical disasters um, in the face of this climate crisis. So when we speak about uh, cumulative impacts, um, mandatory emissions reductions, all of these are part and parcel of reasons why we must have a fundamental, robust, holistic policy that addresses that of, of making sure that we have a full, not just that of the carbon, of decarbonization, <clears throat> but we need a full on approach of making sure that not one of our communities are left behind and are actually made whole. Unfortunately, in the climate discourse, um, chemicals had been extracted out of this, the whole conversation when we even talked about um, a plan to really have uh, address 
the climate crisis. Um, and this is what we, you know, we agree with what Melissa Miles was talking about with respect to that, the, the failures of, of providing wholeness and health to our communities. Um, and so we stay, stand very firm and have stood very firm and weathered the storm of making sure that we place chemicals into this conversation. This is why we're so thankful to be part of this esteemed uh, uh, panel and, your, and the researchers. We're so grateful for the Center for Earth, Energy and Democracy. We'll never forget uh, many years ago when we spoke about the Clean Power Plan um, and how the Clean Power Plan was not gonna fully effectively protect our communities. Um, but what what has been very, uh, how do we say, exceptional for us and these folks and what we need for our viewers to understand is the steadfast diligence of the folks in, in, in this space here, our panel right here, how we stayed the course. And we want to thank both uh, you, Dr. Baptista, and Dr. Sheets, um, and Dr. Lamb, for making sure that folks like the Environmental Justice Health Alliance, the Delaware Concern, the residents and communities in Delaware um, and across this nation are, are heard from. Now, we do have solutions and this can be uh, handled in a fundamental way. Um, we do have ways in which to contribute to how it is that we can reduce our, our emissions reduction. Um, I do want to leave it here and pass it to Stephanie, is that I'm glad to hear what has happened in Minnesota mm -hmm. with respect to the cumulative impacts piece in New Jersey, what's happened with cumulative impacts. I'm sorry to say in Delaware, we were pushing towards that of a cumulative impacts uh, policy, but like our sister Melissa Miles said, <laughs> the unfortunate part about it is that that conversation and the legislation was not going to actually fully benefit our communities. So the bill that was up in Delaware actually died in this last session. Uh, we did not go to the grave with tears of the death of that legislative piece because that particular piece was not going to fully fundamentally protect our communities. So Melissa and 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 uh, Ansha, we will be in touch with you to help us for this next session to make sure that we have the robust policies that we need. Um, we 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 want to change the discourse of this piece, and instead of having pollution and power plants from other uh, uh, neighbor, other states. We want to have a uh, support of of your great policies that helps us be able to lift up a stronger and better policy, so that we can actually walk the walk of what or the talk that our President Biden, who actually hails from the great state of Delaware, since he wants to center environmental justice into the full federal family and all of the policies. We're standing firm and making sure that the state in and of itself equally does the same. And so I'm gonna pass this off to, to Stephanie Heron to continue for uh, to answer this question, but I thank you and we thank you from the EJHA for being able to participate in this process and look forward to continuing to push for the changes that we need to make our communities whole. Absolutely, thanks Michelle. And just so everyone knows, Michelle and I both work for EJHA, the Environmental Justice Health Alliance for Chemical Policy Reform, which as Michelle said, is a national collective of grassroots groups that are disproportionately impacted by legacy pollution. But in addition to our national work, we both happen to be from Delaware and we met in Delaware. So that is why we're here talking about Delaware. And as Michelle mentioned, we have a an EJHA affiliate, the Delaware Concerned Residents for Environmental Justice. And Michelle also mentioned that EJ communities have solutions. And I think it was 
Melissa or someone invoked the HEMAS principles previously in this meeting. And one of the principles is the communities speak for themselves. And EJ communities have solutions. And one of the solutions that EJHA affiliates, along with many advocates from various big groups, small groups all over the country, outside the, the traditional United States, um, came up together about 20 years ago around a vision and framework for the world that they want to live in, which doesn't say some communities are more valuable than others, which is kind of what Dr. Sheets' presentation is about, right? People of color and low-income people are less valued. They're treated as a sacrifice zone for power plants. But in Delaware, like many places, they're also treated as a sacrifice zone for the other kinds of industrial facilities that are causing extremely disproportionate cumulative impacts on their health and their families. And the vision that we work together coming clean EJHA and a number of our partners on is called the Louisville Charter for Safer Chemicals. We It has been recently revamped to more directly include the disproportionate impact of chemicals on the climate crisis and the acceleration of chemical disasters because of the climate crisis. But number the plank number two of the Louisville Charter, which I'm going to drop the, the link to in the chat, is that we must prevent disproportionate exposures and hazards and reduce cumulative impacts on EJ communities. And we must do that from power plants, from chemical plants, from industrial facilities, and from other polluters that are not the ones you might traditionally think of. So we are excited to participate in the Q&A and thank you all. Platform. Oh, thank and you. also- The I'm platform, reminding, yeah. <laughs> reminding me that one of the ways that we know all of you, uh, Dr. Sheets, Dr. Baptista, Melissa, is uh, Richard, we are all also, um, our organizations were co-signatories, co-founding signatories of the Equitable and Just Climate Platform, where Ancha supports, Ancha and her amazing colleagues at SEED provide a huge amount of support for our work on moving the environmental justice impacts that Melissa was talking about, making sure they're not left out of future climate policy. And we're excited to also work with you all on doing the same with chemicals policy. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Steph and Michelle, both of you for your amazing comments and your work. Um, you know, I know you're gonna hold us uh, and keep us honest because we're gonna get, we're also gonna see this apply to the industrial and chemical sector for sure. So, um, and the platform is another space uh, where we can share the link here to the Equitable and Just National Climate Platform. We're also uh, building out an approach to MER with our platform partners there as well. So you'll be seeing more about MER from the platform in the coming months. Um, so I'm going to get us started on Q&A because we have some questions that came in from the audience. Um, and I maybe um, we'll start with the first one. Um, which is about how we see the mandatory emissions reduction policy moving forward and getting applied at either, are we gonna focus at the state level, the local municipal level or the federal approach? And um, you know, maybe Dr. She, you, you wanna get us started here and, and you can, I know you, you wanted to mention the, a little bit of the timeline of, of the policy. So if you wanted to share that slide and respond to this, get us started in response to this question about how you see it being implemented. Um, because I know you're working in New Jersey on an MER policy. I know we're working in the platform at a national level to look at an MER policy. Um, so I don't know if you wanna share that or if you just wanna share the slide about the timeline, it's up to you. And others, of course, Ancha, um, Steph, Michelle, Melissa, if you have thoughts on where you'd like to focus your attention in terms of implementing MER. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Let me let me quickly share a, a slide that I neglected to show, forgot to show, um, but people have referred um, to existing uh, carbon trading programs. There are two existing carbon trading programs now, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is in the East with 10 states, and AB 32 in California, and then the clean power plan people have uh, mentioned, that was EPA's original 
uh, climate change uh, mitigation rule, which was issued back in 2014, which didn't survive um, judicial scrutiny. And it was essentially a carbon trading program also. And so now EPA's rule, which was just issued in May, is the one that is actually promoting um, uh, hydrogen co-firing and CCS. And so our vision for our vision for this is that, and people have mentioned Equum Just National Climate Platform. Um, we we are uh, about the issue. <laughs> We've been about the issue for a while, though. About the issue, a, a document on mandatory emission reductions. Um, you know, that gives the basic policy. And what we hope is that EJ organizations around the country, maybe other organizations, may want to use this document. Um, as a basis um, to develop their own mandatory emission reduction policy on a state level. And we would, um, you know, with as much capacity as we can give, we, we would support folks uh, in those efforts. And in New Jersey, I don't know if Melissa wants to say more about this. We, you know, we've actually been trying to um, uh, implement this idea in New Jersey, convincing the state government to implement this idea for a while now. And we're going to unleash a new statewide campaign because uh, we we're, we're keep trying, just like with cumulative impacts. We worked on that for almost two decades before we got our law in New Jersey. And we haven't given up on mandatory emission reduction either. And at the same time, we hope the document we release from the platform uh, can form the basis for a national mandatory emission reduction policy. So we're really thinking about it on on um, on both levels, and I have to say, already on the national level, uh, we we've had some impact because at, at times EPA has said to us that instead of instead of going purely on some of the there are other existing carbon trading programs like with NOx on a kind of smaller level, uh, sulfur dioxide that this has impacted their thinking, affected their thinking. And that they're also thinking about having some kind of um, some kind of some kind of emission standard. They haven't gotten to the point where they're talking about applying it in EJ communities or even emission standard for all, um, you know, uh, emission standard in in addition to to what's happening with the with the trading programs on all the programs. But at least we've had that impact. So I think that's where we're going with this on both state and national level, and we'll see we'll see how it develops. Great. Now, if any other panelists wanted to um, share any plans or <laughs> or hopes for where you see the implementation of it, um, I can pick up from where Nikki left off. Well, one, I, I will say, you know, as a an ED, uh, I would be really reluctant to share all my plans before they, you know, <laughs> <laughs> probably understand, you know, like, but, um, you know, I think in general, uh, New Jersey has heard a lot from Dr. Sheets and, you know, yourself, Dr. Bautista, over the last 10 years or more about mandatory emissions reductions. It's almost as popular as cumulative impacts, I would say, um, and especially amongst, you know, the environmental sector, you know, many groups have been um, thinking about mandatory emissions reductions. Many groups have read um, Dr. Sheets paper and want to know more, want to know how they can integrate it into um, climate change policy. Uh, so, you know, I think there's definitely an appetite for it and support for it in New Jersey. Um, but, I, you know, I, one thing that we've talked about a lot is um, how as, you know, a statewide organization, you know, we are comprised of the people we, you know, work with um, in communities, that we feel it's important that this grow out of communities rather than out of you know the the environmental sector per se, right? We know that we're going to need um, broad support um, from foundations, from um, you know allies, uh, but we want to make sure that this is really grounded in in the people and in the communities that are most impacted. So that always takes longer, and it's way more difficult than making policy in a, a closed room 
of, you know, 10 or 12 people who are paid professionals. It is far more difficult to um, help, you know, train communities to the point where they too can weigh in on policy. But it's really the way that we have to do things if we want to really get to the type of um, future that we want to see, because we know, you know, communities must speak for themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah. Nikki, did you want to add anything there? Well, I was going to say the future of the policy, too, is what you heard from um, Michelle and Stephanie. I mean, I think, you know, what they're talking about is exactly what we want. And, you know, we're going to help there pick up the policy and apply in other areas, too. And if I could just say very quickly, this is one of the things that we've been intentionally doing as we talk about this, quote, strategic partnership with the Coming Clean Network. Um, as you heard Stephanie speak to the Louisville Charter, that was that piece was created by like a lot of academics and um, there were community people engaged. However, what we are doing now, what we have been working on with respect to that paper is updating that charter into the political moment of now right? What does that mean now on today's level? And speaking to what Melissa was saying is making sure that it is definitely rooted and grounded in the voices and the impacts and the issues and the challenges and the legacy of the communities who have been bearing the brunt of this, right? And so we are in, that's, we have been really within our two networks, if you will, really trying to ground truth, making sure it's totally ground truth mm -hmm. and, and um, uh, in such a way that we are able to lift that up into the challenges and issues that we see today and making sure that it it speaks to like what we're seeing these nuances of CCS, CCUS, blue hydrogen and so on and so forth. So that's how we feel in addition to that of the small batch and larger chemical feedstocks that um, have been incorporated and included in um, in this process. And last, the fact that we really need a full chemicals management systems within us that is based on precaution, not risk. And, may, and we can do that. Um, uh, and that's where we believe that this valuable body of work that has been produced will help us be able to leverage what we're seeking to do in our space. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, for your responses uh, on that. And, you know, when we started doing the, this paper, we were all thinking about how to reduce pollution from power plants in the context of carbon trading and a lot of uh, carbon markets that already existed either through Regi or in other parts of the country that are being proposed nationally as well through the Clean Power Plan. But when we finished writing this paper, what became clear was that the ascendancy of carbon management as the, the paradigm shift here in terms of instead of a full transition away from fossil fuels, this attempt by the fossil fuel industry to introduce new ways um, to continue um, their practices, to prolong the life of their infrastructures um, through the use of things like CCS and hydrogen co-firing. And I know there were some questions on the chat about whether we, how we consider renewable natural gas, which is just a, I think a fancy way of saying methane and uh, in um, hy how hydrogen co-firing and, and it produces uh, NOx, it also produces other co-pollutants, but NOx certainly is a big concern. You know, and I think um, it's fair to say that we consider uh, these uh, hydrogen R in RNG um, CCS as, as uh, really not the solution. This, this is not only not going to further our climate mitigation goals, it may entrench fossil fuel interests further. And more, you know, more importantly for this, this topic today, risks further burdening communities that are already burdened by these infrastructures even more, which is the most insidious part of these proposals right now is that they promise CO2 reductions without, you know, but it but increase 
co-pollutants that harm people um, that are already being overburdened and harmed. Um, and so um, there's a, a really terrible equation there that gets us further away from our goals. Um, so um, I think that we wanted to ask this other question around um, trying to end on a high note, not on the false solutions note, <laughs> because we're really, we're talking about reducing pollution, not, you know, uh, continuing the, the false solutions and the, and the fossil fuels. Um, but wanted to ask all the panelists if they wanted to share, um, you know, their ideas of, of what is to be done and uh, what are some of the community strategies and responses um, that you see as being the most hopeful or, you know, the most, the things that you're most excited about that can be coupled with MER with mandatory emissions reductions as solutions, right? So we have mandatory emissions reductions but there are many other, I think Dr. Sheet says this all the time, where it's gonna take a lot to get us into this mess that we're gonna need a whole toolbox of tools, really. Um, it's not just one policy that's gonna address environmental um, justice issues. So what are the community-led solutions that you all um, are, are most uh, engaged on right now that you, or that you could share with the, the folks here? So to me, the... The beauty of something like the Louisville Charter is that it came from the communities. And so like the communities that EJHA works with, they may have a power plant or more than one power plant in their communities. And some of them have a power plant that's at a chemical plant. But at the end of the day, they say, you know, there are 188 hazardous air pollution pollutants and there are thousands of chemicals that we aren't even measuring for and we've never even studied the impacts of in addition to the PM 2.5 and the NOx and SOx that are coming from that refinery and the power plant that's running that refinery that's on site. Mm -hmm. So for the things that make me really hopeful is that communities shaping the conversation and driving the narrative from a place of health, mm -hmm. wellness, wholeness. Mr. Delma Bennett, who's one of our longtime community leaders and affiliates from Mossville, Louisiana, always just says, we just wanna be made whole. And framing the solution, like start leading with solutions and leading with wholeness and leading with health and precaution, like Michelle was saying, instead of coming from a place of having to prove that this already has harmed us and this is why we need to do it differently. We know that the way that we've built the economy now that's based on fossil fuels and sacrificing certain communities for the benefit of the whole is not the right way, right? So we, but communities have solutions and leading with that, with those solutions, with that vision of just wanting to live in a place that's safe for your family and that's healthy and where you feel whole mm -hmm. as a person, right? Like I think framing our, all of our solutions, that's, that, that achieves the chemicals management systems crisis that we're in. That achieves the climate solutions, the climate crisis that we're in, right? If we just resolved, if we led from a place of communities being whole, being safe, whether it's from sea level rise or fires or chemicals, that I think that is like what continues to motivate me all the time is getting to work with our affiliates and hearing that framing from them and just connecting back one other quick thing I wanna say to your point about extending the life of fossil fuels. We know that CCS and hydrogen co-firing, that these are false solutions, but they're also false solutions in that the chemical companies see the, or the BPs and the, the big oil drillers, and they see the writing on the wall. And by 2050, petrochemicals are expected to drive at least half of global demand for fossil fuels. So we are in some ways winning on power plants, like Ancha was saying, which is awesome and exciting and that gives me hope and we need to apply that those same victories to all of the sources of pollution in our community and that makes me very excited thank you Steph. how about you Ansha? <laughs> yeah i mean we, we still i'm it's great that we finally like have some movement at the legislature but there's still a long way to go for, for minnesota the way i see it the law has a lot of loopholes and um, how it gets implemented is really what's going to determine whether like actual benefits are created or not. 
Um, but uh, uh, going back to your original question, Dr. Baptista, a strategy um, that you know we see it as an organization we spend a lot of our time on and resources on is, is focusing on energy efficiency and the building sector. And so that that area of our work um, gives me a lot of hope because it's it's very hyper local and um, we basically work with neighborhood associations that literally serve um, a couple of blocks of the city um, and we work with them to ensure that their constituents have access to energy efficiency programs and energy efficiency services and they're able to make their utility bills and they're able to make um, their rent and um, that they have, they, they're able to uh, create healthy and safe and affordable homes for themselves. Uh, and so sometimes with the power sector, like we, we forget like what it's for, what it's supposed to be for. It's supposed to meet our energy needs and, and it's supposed to serve our, our energy needs. Um, and even on that end, um, sometimes the, the communities that are burdened by the pollution that create that's created by the sector are also not don't receive any of the benefits that that, that sector is supposed to create um and so you know the northeast minneapolis neighborhood that i just spoke about that's host to the riverside plant that same community is also energy energy cost burden so that same community is not able to make utility bills um and so at that area of our work really gives me a lot of hope because it's so tangible and it's directly working with communities to and it's also directly working with utilities and the Minnesota Department of Commerce to improve their program so that um, folks don't have to worry about making rent every month and folks don't have to worry about, folks don't have to take on mental and emotional stress and financial stress to, to make monthly payments. So um, the energy efficiency part of our work really gives me a lot of hope. And it also goes back to the question someone asked about renewable natural gas. It's the same thing. It's just like another... <laughs> tactic to get like keep um gas utilities alive they're just coming up with another way to to utilize the gas infrastructure that they've built up over decades so thank you and we just have uh one more minute so i don't know if, if nikki or any uh, melissa you want to share any highlights or you're also welcome to put links in the chat if there's any thing you want to you're working on that you want to share with folks before we sign off I would just say the EJ law gives me a lot of hope and, you know, mainly because it really was the product of grassroots organizing over over a decade long of folks never, um, you know, letting that banner touch the ground of cumulative impacts and how much I see regular everyday people are engaging with the law and asking questions like, what about the trucks? What about the smell? So, I think we have an excellent tool to begin, um, you know, to continue the work of making um, New Jerseyans understand that this is not normal, right? All this pollution, all these smells, all this infrastructure, um, we don't have to live like this. And so I think the, um, you know, the law is really, is really helping with that. And that makes me hopeful. And I I, I think what we need to do, we, we we need to use the fight against climate change to transform the so society. We need it. We need it to center equity while we're doing it, though. We need to extend this idea of mandatory emission reductions to the chemical sector, to the um, to the transportation sector, and you know we need to always center. We're going to make people healthier, um, and we're going to reduce inequities while we fight climate change. And it just it has to be bolder though. We have to we have to make it a bolder idea and we have to reorder things to to get this to accomplished. Always with equity at the center, not with cost and profit at the center. Yes. Thank you, Nikki. What a wonderful way to close out our panel. I want to thank our presenters, our panelists, our co-authors on the paper. The paper is available here. You can scan the QR code or find it on our website. So, um, so we'll be sharing that on the link here. Um, 
And I just want to thank all of you for joining us today for this conversation. Uh, if you have questions or follow up uh, about the report or the presentations today, please feel free to reach out to us. I, I think our contact info is on the website and here in the chat as well. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Yay. Enjoy the rest of Climate Week and thank you all for a wonderful presentation. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Together we win. Yes. Together we win.